Morgan, so patient. Thank you for waiting. Um, I am genuinely very excited about this. I use Python quite a lot to manipulate my data, so I'm delighted to, to hear more about Pyrolite, which is a fantastic Python package. Um, I'm just going to hand over straight away to you, so off you go. Sure. This is nice. All right. Uh, good afternoon or good evening um, from Perth. Uh, good morning for Europe. Um, I'm Morgan. I'm a geochemist and data scientist at CSIRO Mineral Resources in Perth. Uh, if you want to find me on Twitter, I'm at Metasunlight. Um, I've also been working on making lambdas more accessible lately. And given the, the timing of this talk in about 20 minutes and the fact that Michael's already covered lambdas in a bit of detail, uh, this talk is going to be a bit more software focused. Um, but we'll be covering aspects which are useful for working with rare earth data. So this is going to be a bit of a quick tour of Pyrolite, um, including talking a little bit about what it is and why it exists, um, going through handling a bit of geochemical data, some visualization aspects, um, how we can put some geochemical data to work. Uh, there'll be a short demonstration because it is a bit of a workshop after all. Um, and just at the end, I'll talk a bit about how, if you want to get started or get involved in the project, how you might do so. Uh, it's a short time slot, but hopefully there's a little bit of time for Q&A at the end. So what is Pyrolite? Uh, Pyrolite is essentially a set of tools for working with geochemical data. Uh, it's an open source Python package, which is essentially a bundle of reusable code. Um, it's freely available and you're able to see and suggest changes to the code. And it's under active development. Um, which means that it's likely to change a bit in the future um, and eventually is aiming to be a bit of a community-driven project. Uh, it doesn't have a graphical user interface, so it's not quite an app, but instead it's designed to be used programmatically. So it's allowing you to leverage the scientific Python ecosystem as you desire. Um, it's not a silver bullet for geochemical data interpretation issues, um, but hopefully it would streamline the process and it kind of lines up some workflows you might better use. Uh, I think it was mentioned a little bit before in the chat. Um, we published this uh, mid through last year. Uh, this is essentially just a short overview paper. If you want to use something for reference, the documentation might be a bit of a uh, better starting point. And there's a bunch of examples there that you can go through as well. So just before I get into the Pyrolite stuff, I just want to talk a little bit about what the bigger idea behind some of this is. Um, and it's really about encouraging a programmatic approach to geochemical data analysis. Um, so this is going through defining explicit workflows for what we're doing with a geochemical data analysis, defining inputs and outputs, what happens in between, um, and also supporting documentation, uh, citation of work, software or individual workflows, um, and working towards more robust and reproducible analysis so that we can have confidence in what we're doing. Um, and also trying to encourage reuse of research code, so avoiding reinventing the, world, uh, the wheel. You don't want to have 13 different versions of ternary diagrams that everyone has to remake themselves. Um, and instead, we can provide some tools for the community. Um, and the idea here is to link into an interoperable ecosystem um, so we can integrate with other systems um, and automate some things where it makes sense, and also scale and deal with bigger data sets and more varied data sets. Uh, to support all of this, the tools that we're trying to build need to be accessible. And I think Michael's apps are a good example of making something fairly accessible. Um, we try to make things easy to get into, uh, well-documented. Um, most of what I do is released freely and it, a lot of it's able to be run almost anywhere. So it doesn't matter what operating system you're on. And we're trying to build a bit of a community around it to make it a bit more sustainable. And so we can all drive where it goes and get a bit of consensus about what we want from geochemical data workflows. Um, and a bit of that is the education side of it. So getting people up to speed with Python and Pyrolite. So back to Pyrolite. Um, geochemical data itself is a little bit special, um, given we're typically working with compositional data, data which sums to 100%, um, and we're often interested in relative quantities, so things normalized to primitive mantle um, or element ratios and things like that. And then sometimes we want to list things as elements, sometimes as oxides, and we want to transform between them. Um, and we use a bunch of different reference compositions, um, be it for whole rock reservoirs, like mantle reservoirs we talked about before. Um, or mineral compositions. And Pyrolite has uh, all of these things, it has uh, databases for reference compositions, minerals, and provides the ability to transform between elements and oxides uh, arbitrarily almost, and also do some operations on mineral compositions as well. When it comes to dealing with composition data, uh, in large part, uh, we still seem to ignore the closed nature of our data um, and this purest correlation which arises from it. 
and tough on results in erroneous statistical measures. Uh, the example on the right here is from HSN in 1984. And it's essentially just one composition uh, with five components. Shown here in a series of ternary diagrams. The mean, if you just took the absolute mean in Excel, is plotted as the red squares through here. And the black squares are the compositional means, which much better represent the density distribution of these compositions. Uh, Pyrolite provides log ratio transforms um, to get around this in most cases, um, and especially for major elements of data where this is a bit of a problem. Uh, overall, Pyrolite provides a bit of specialized functionality to complement the general tools. You could write um, things to do this yourself, um, but Pyrolite, uh, the idea is that it provides tools so you can get started with your data a bit faster. And the interface is really designed around your data, which I'll show you in a little bit. Um, but rather than trying to squeeze your data set into someone else's meat grinder, um, it's designed to complement what you're doing already. It kind of knows the nature of the geochemical data you're working with. Uh, when it comes to visualization, uh, which is a key part of data communication and a lot of what we're doing, but it's often a bit harder than it needs to be. Uh, we know there are a number of common diagrams we use other than standard bioric plots, so ternary diagrams, spider diagrams. Um, and Paralyte provides access to these types of things, as well as trying to address issues with overplotting. Now that we're getting to a point where we're having big enough data sets that we can't discern what's going on in some of these data clouds, we need to have sort of alternate ways to visualize it, whether it be visualizing data density, this is kernel density estimation, looking at things in contours, and this is really good if you want to display this behind another data set you want to look at, or even the heat scatter diagrams, which kind of are the best of both worlds between scatter and density diagrams. Um, the, the interface for these, like transforming geochemical data, is it really reflects the tools that it's built on top of in order to be interoperable. Um, so Pyrolyte is designed to play nicely with other tools so that you can mix and match where you want to, where you want to use Pyrolyte, you can, where you want to use it, you can. And that highly customizable thing is often quite useful. Uh, as this is a session on Revis, um, I've also been working on lambdas for the past two years or so um, in a simple sense to start with um, and going a little bit more customizable since adding tetrads and anomalies and this type of thing. Um, the lambdas implementation in Pyrolyte is fairly comparable to the things Michael's shown you earlier. Um, it's a customizable implementation of what uh, Hugh O'Neill did back in 2016. Um, you can change the parameterization a little bit more flexibly just in case your data set looks a bit different. Um, generally, um, we've tested it and it's consistent with what you did originally if you use the same parameterization, but it's been updated to be consistent with uh, Michael's two apps. So if you calculate lambdas in Pyrolyte, they should be the same as lambdas you calculate in the apps. Um, recently, I've added the tetrads anomalies as well as the fit measures and parameter uncertainties, and this will be um, released in version 0.3. Uh, just one thing I wanted to note here is that the lambdas, um, as well as being a good way to parameterize your rare earth data, can be particularly useful if you want to use rare earth data for modeling or machine learning, where the, the issues of sort of multi collinearity, where everything's correlated to one another, as well as the dimensionality being sort of 14 dimensional um, for the rare earth data is a bit of an issue. Uh, so if you want to chat about using rare earths and lambdas for machine learning, um, which can be quite useful. You can chat to me later about that. Um, the, the idea of Pyrolyte is largely uh, to make these linkages between data tools and models. Um, by establishing these links, we can get more out of our data and actually put it to work. Um, so we want to link our data to modeling, whether that be lattice strain, which is another thing that's in Pyrolyte at the moment as a, an extension for working with AlphaMets data, uh, the tables that spit out AlphaMets, um, some useful things for visualizing there but also linking it to machine learning. And this is one of the things I've been doing quite a bit of. Um, tectonic discrimination, all these kinds of things where you probably want to use a bit of rare earth data, um, it can come in quite useful. Um, the good thing here is that the scientific Python ecosystem comes with batteries included, and regardless of whether you want to do a bit of modeling, stats, uh, machine learning, or even make a website, um, you can kind of link all of these things up and try and build something bigger from it. And it's where taking a programmatic approach makes life a little bit easier. So if you did want to take a look at the documentation for Pyrolyte, it's at pyrolyte.rtfd.io. Um, so there's galleries of examples there. So this will go through each of these types of things and you can 
see what code generated each of these figures and ways to customize them and things like that. Um, we we'll put a decent amount of work into this to try and make it a little bit easier to get started. And now I'm just going to go into a, a bit of a, a quick demonstration. I've got about 10 minutes or so left in the talk. And I'll probably take most of that to get through some of the demonstrations. Um, but just go through some of the Pyrolytes features and what it looks like in practice, um, which is essentially code. Uh, if you do want to play along from home, you can follow this link here, tinyurl.com forward slash minsock re pyrolyte. And I'm just going to go over to that now. And this will be available later as well if anyone's interested. So if you follow that link, you should end up at something that looks a little bit like this. This is kind of just a landing page. And there's a series of examples through here. Uh, I won't go through all of them today, um, but it just shows a little bit of how to get into Pyrolyte and what it does. Um, and if you want a bit of more, more information, there's a bunch of links down the bottom. So just give you a bit of an idea of um, what working with Pyrolyte looks like, given that it is mostly a uh, programmatic interface. Um, here, this is a Jupyter Lab. If you haven't used it before, um, basically the main thing you didn't know, if you select a cell, you can use shift enter and then it will run that cell. If you're lucky. Live coding is always a bad idea. So basically, uh, these are a few imports. So other libraries which we use as well as Pyrolyte Geochemistry. Um, here we just create a, a simple table of data. It's a data frame, um, but it's basically just a data table with a series of oxide columns, a series of elemental columns, and we just added a strong 87 and 86 ratio on the end for good measure. It's just a synthetic data set which makes it a bit easy to play with. Um, when it comes to pulling out your data, there's a, a lot of work often goes into just finding what you want to play with. Um, Pyrolyte provides a sort of easy way to get to it. So here, DF is our data frame, which is this guy here. And we can use the df.pyrocan.oxides to just pull out the oxides from that. So essentially all the rows of that table are just pulling out oxide columns. Um, and we can do that also for elements or for row F data. Here the dot head two is just saying I just want the first two rows. Um, there is a REY which pulls out the rare earths as well as yttrium for those who are asking about yttrium before. Um, there's nothing for scanium at the moment, but if you wanted to play with Whereas plus yttrium, that'll give it to you in the right order as well. In this case, there's only lanthanum and tissue in these. But that gives you a bit of an idea of how to pull out things from data frames. Um, it also pull out isotopations, all those kind of things. Uh, there's also uh, functions for scaling data. So often you want to scale um, elemental data from, say, ppm to weight percent. In this case, we're just pulling out the elements from our data frame above and creating a copy. And in that copy, we're scaling our data from ppm to weight percent. You can see the top one here is the original data, which is in ppm, and this is scaled back down to weight percent, so divided by 10,000. So. Pyrolyte also enables you to convert chemical components. So say if you wanted to go from a current data frame, which has these columns, um, and we want to convert, say, calcium oxide or sodium oxide to elemental values um, and add some ratios on the end, you can do that as well. Uh, that'll just do the conversion for you. And then also specifically for iron, if you have iron as total iron and you want to split it um, based on a molecular ratio and say into 90% molecular ferrous iron and 10% molecular ferric iron, it can do that for you as well. Um, anything it doesn't really know what's going on with, it'll just append on the left. That's a bit of an idea of just some simple things you can do with Pyrolyte. Um, I'm going to skip over the next notebook, which is munging some JIRA up data, just in the interest of time, um, and talk a little bit about visualization. So this is where you can start to having a little bit of fun. Um, here we're just pulling in the data frame, which we had used earlier. So this is pulling a CSV for CAP from JIRA directly. Um, We've put a function here, which is also available in this script, which just pulls that data, rearranges a little bit, and changes the column names so that we can work with them in Pyrolyte. The, the data itself has some zeros, which Pyrolyte generally doesn't um, like. There's not really such thing as zero 
or in geochemistry in all those cases. So I've just got rid of those zeros. Um, but the simple plots um, are really easy to get to. We, we take our, our data frame, which is just that table. In this case, it has a bunch of extra columns um, and in true geo fashion, a lot of them are capitalized. Um, you notice I've proper cased a bunch of isotope ratios and elements on the end of it. But that's what our data frame looks like. Um, here, we're just taking two columns out and we want to plot a scatter plot. Uh, it's fairly simple to do. And there's various ways you can do this in Python. Uh, Pyrolite just provides us a sort of simple API to access it. Uh, but in the same way, we can take uh, two same columns and make a density plot. Um, you might notice that this density plot crosses the x-axis here. Um, so there's magnesium density below zero, which doesn't really make sense. So you can convert it to a, a log grid if you wanted to. It should make more sense uh, geochemically. And that should then hopefully better represent our data density here and be a bit more logical. Uh, you can also look at heat scatter diagrams I showed a few before. The good thing is you can do the same for ternary plots. So if you just specify, say, three columns here, you can just create a scatter ternary plot fairly simply, and also the same for heat scatter. Now down the spider plots, which are a bit more relevant for rare earths. Um, here, what we're doing is combining the Pyrochem API, so going from our data table here and taking Pyrochem, taking the rare earths out of this data set. And then we want to normalize them to primitive mantle. So there's a variety of different um, reservoirs you can normalize things to. I just use primitive mantle here. And then again, using the Pyroplot API, spitting out a spider diagram. We can see the data coming out of GeoRock isn't necessarily amazing. Um, there's a bunch of zigzags back here, which may just be pre-normalized data. So you potentially be able to pull that out. Um, for the rare earth specifically, uh, there's a spider diagram which is adapted to give um, spacing of the labels based off the radii. And you can switch these axes around to have um, ionic radius on the x-axis if you wanted to, um, but there's diagrams specifically for that and you can customize them as you want. And you can also map variables from your data set. So if you wanted to have the color represent the amount of magnesium oxide in these rocks, um, we can simply specify C equals DFNGO. So it's taking the magnesium oxide column from your data frame and mapping that to a color for each of these lines and scatter plots here. And similarly, you can even do uh, density diagrams for spider plots. And this really pulls out that zigzag issue in that data set. So it's useful for debugging as well. All right, now to some lambdas. So this is the last notebook in here. Uh, again, we have a, a few little imports here, um, mainly making use of Pyrolite plot. And we're pulling in a synthetic data frame here um, based on depleted mantle from Salters and Strachey 2004. And we're adding a synthetic European anomaly and just a small positive one. So I can see um, when we plot this up after we normalize it to the chondrite from Hugh O'Neill's paper in 2016. Uh, these guys here. So this is our synthetic data set. Um, and we're going to try and calculate some lambdas from this. So in the simplest sense, just calculate lambdas. We use the, the Pyrochem API um, here using lambda LNRE. So what this is going to do is take our, our synthetic data frame. It's going to uh, normalize it to chondrite. And then it's going to take the logarithm natural logarithm of those values, and then we're going to calculate some lambdas. And you can change the degree here. So if you only want lambda 3, you could use degree 4. Uh, if you want lambda 4, you can calculate degree 5. And just have a quick look at that table. But spitting out. Is it let me? So this is the type of output that you can expect. Um, if you change the degree down, you'll only get up to one three. Yes, decided to run the rest of it. Um, another thing I want to show you here is you can also go the other way. So similar to Michael's app, uh, you can recombine these patterns. And this is just taking the last pattern from our data set up here. 
and plotting the components as well as the fitted line and the data behind it. So in this case, we've excluded europium because we know it's anomalous, um, but this shows each of those lambda zero components in blue. This is the lambda one component, um, lambda two and lambda three. Uh, in this case, plotting the values themselves isn't particularly informative because it's based off a normal distribution to start with. Um, so that's probably about what we'd expect. When it comes to calculating anomalies, um, it, it's fairly easy to do. You could just specify which anomalies you want. If you want to calculate some strange anomaly that is not serum or European, you could do so, um, but be confident <laughs> that it actually means something if you want to do so. Um, and similarly to fit tetrads, we just need another parameter in here. So if we wanted to just add tetrads, we could go fit tetrads. And if we look at the table that's spitting out, we've got lambdas, we've got tetrads, and we've got anomalies on the end. Uh, we're working on spitting out some of the fit parameters and things like that as well at the moment. I'm just going to one of the questions before around um, I think it was a little bit around lambdas and how confident you can be. Here I've made some synthetic profiles just based on lambdas and fit them with lambdas and then fit them with tetrads, just to give you an idea of if tetrads, if you're fitting tetrads that aren't there, what is it going to look like and what is it going to do to your lambdas? Because we know that that independence criterion breaks down um, if you're fitting both at the same time. And similarly, fitting profiles which are dominated by tetrads and what does that then do to your lambdas if you don't account for them? Um, so if tetrads are there, you're pretty confident, now make sure to fit them and you get something which is close to what it should be. Now I'm just going to switch back to my presentation for one or two more slides and then that's it. So this is a bit of an idea of what you can start to do with bigger data sets. Uh, this is a large database of lambdas for arcane and proteodotic basalts. Um, illustrating sort of range of flavors. Uh, it's a very similar diagram in Hugh's paper, um, but this is one that's just being produced in Pyrolite. Uh, also, when it comes to looking at anomalous anomalies, so that idea of um, if you assume that the smooth lambda based curve is reality, how badly are we potentially calculating anomalies based on linear interpolation? This gives you a little bit of an idea in that uh, it depends on how curved they are and specifically how lambda curved how lambda two the curve they are and how lambda three curve they are. Um, and specifically for cerium, if you have um, lambda threes that are very different from zero, you're probably calculating anomalies quite badly, which makes sense to some degree. If you do want to get involved, um, I always want to chat about getting started. Uh, if you find a bug or want to request a feature, um, feel free to get in touch on Twitter, um, on Gitter as well. There's a chat room here. Um, if you want to let's see. If you find a bug or want to request a feature, check out GitHub and there's ways to do it there. Um, that's me. Thank you very much. I just want to give a shout out to all the contributors to Pyrolight. This is the current list on the website, but I think it's about to expand a little bit. Super. Thank you so much, Maureen. That was excellent. Um, that, yeah, thank that. It's so much work has gone into developers. It's, it's actually mind blowing how much has gone and when when did you start kind of developing Pyrolite? Uh, so I think midway through the first year of my postdoc, so it would have been what, 2018. Yeah, okay, it shows how much work goes into developing this sort of thing. It's, it's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Um, there isn't any questions at the moment, so please just to pop them in the Q&A, but I do have a question. Can it calculate APFU? <laughs> Which would be really helpful. Uh, yes. Uh, if you have a, if you can specify the model for a, a mineral, then yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Great. I haven't taken it into anything complicated yet. Okay. Just sort of simple rock forming minerals, but there, there's a whole submodule pyrolite dedicated to minerals, mineral compositions, um, sort of unmixing things. Okay. Stuff like I, that. Yeah. Okay. I need to delve a bit deeper into ground because I have lots of non-rock forming minerals that I could I could do with, uh, <laughs> do with work. Yeah, I, when you get to multiple site partitioning and things like that, then yeah, it's complicated. <laughs> yeah. It's complicated anyway. That is brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, 
Michael is still on the line if anyone else needs to drop a question. Uh, people are, are zooming off quite quickly because we have kind of reached the, the end of our time. Sorry, Morgan, we did we did overrun a little okay. bit. Um, but um, we have one from Alistair Murphy. Alistair, if you want to ask. Oh, no, he wants me to ask. Sorry. Um, when loading data from GeoRock, uh, so you, you know the big GeoRock database, Morgan, I assume. Yeah. yeah. Um, can you include a pandas converters argument to deal with strings? Ooh, that would be. Uh, so, well, at, at the moment, there is a extension in the works to deal with GeoRock and FCAM data, which will kind of sort out most of it for you, including references and all that kind of stuff, because that is automatically output in some of them. Yeah. Um, if you're interested in contributing, let me know. Uh, at the moment, Pyrolyte won't automatically pull from GeoRock for you and clean it up, um, but there is an example of just very simple cleaning up in that uh, notebook. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. That's really, that is a really useful, it's so powerful when you can get a computer to tidy up your data and you know it's right, <laughs> rather than, you know, you missing a zero somewhere. Yeah, and I, I think one of the key things is making sure that you can test it and verify it's doing what you think it is. Exactly, exactly. Which is the other um, side, which I haven't really talked about. Yeah, I guess the, the, the thing to say is that Python is free and open source and open access, so, you know, it's, if you want to learn how to code, it's, it's a great language to, to learn. As someone who is really quite terrible at computers, even I could figure out PyRite. So that is testament to its ease <laughs> of use. Yeah, I'm, see, I'm seeing nods on I'm seeing nods on screen. And um, I think the way geoscience is going and, and working with very big data sets, it's just such a useful thing, such a useful thing to have. Um, and, um, everyone is, you're getting glowing reviews, everyone. Everyone is delighted and really enjoyed the workshop. So massive thanks to Morgan and Michael and to Mark Alban who, who left earlier. Um, so I think we'll close it there. I think it's all just thank yous, et cetera.